All right. So first thing is let's see if you can hear me. Testing, testing, testing. So I can't look at that. <laughs> it's, when I do it this way, there's a lag on it. So, so yes, if you can hear me, let me know. Because I'm not hearing back, of course, and there's a lag, so. All right. Okay, so, the reason I'm doing this is to find out if it's possible to, oh, good, and Anthony, hello, Anthony, um, is it, is the, is the sound and the voice, um, is the sound and the voice in sync? Oh, this is going to drive me nuts if I look at the video, huh? Because it's like four or five seconds after. <laughs> that means your answers are going to also be four or five seconds after. Oh. But this is better because I get to use... It's like if I want to... Uh, I can share screens and share windows and stuff like that. And that helps me. Like if I want to talk about scales, I can put scales on Finale and you can see it. Okay, well, very good. Thank you, Anthony. Well, let's do this then. <laughs> um, now, just keep in mind, when I do it this way, it is going to lag. So your... Um, your um what do you call it your questions will be popping up slower than normal because you're hearing me slower than normal um anyway very good this is working and i think i can you yeah happy new new year anthony I wasn't going to do this. I think I mentioned to you in um, one of the, the the comments. I think I mentioned to you that I was going to um, hold off until the seventh. But then I had this idea to do forty days of uh, face face uh, not Facebook YouTube posts, um, which means that this first day would be the, the sticking to my schedule, you know. Hello, Sharon. Happy New Year. Yeah, so uh, do we have any questions to get started? I can't wait to use this. <laughs> I have two things geared up that I can use for demonstrations and stuff like that. Hello, Javier. Nice to see you. Happy New Year to you and your family, too. All right. So this is actually kind of exciting. Um, anybody got any questions? So, you know what? While we're waiting for questions, let me show you what I'm doing. <laughs> so, um, I have it set up to where... I can open Finale, which I'm doing now. I'll go to default document so it doesn't take so long. And then I can do this. Huh? And then I can go in there and I can if I'm talking about scales, I can show you the scales that we're talking about. If we're talking about jazz stuff, I can show you the jazz stuff that I'm talking about. 
okay? And I'm thinking that's going to be great for demonstration purposes. And, um, yeah, so I'm excited about that. And then I can switch right back. And here we are. And I've got another a sketch pad that I can like draw with my finger and show stuff that way. So yeah. Hello Nino. Nice to see you. Javier has a question. I've been camping on Pioneer Tyro and Player. And I just got into Apprentice, and I can play it easily. How long should I stay on Apprentice? You know, Apprentice, Happy New Year, Mr. Walker. Apprentice is, now I don't know if that means I'm streaming or not. Let me see. That should be all right. Okay. So, um, I think... Apprentice is, is, you can move on sooner from Apprentice than the other ones because it's just a whole step. So yeah, I think um, a, a month maybe, or a week or two. I mean, a, 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 a few weeks, what am I saying a week or two? I'm a little like, <laughs> I'm a little, um, yeah. It's, I'm distracted because of this new option here. And I'm looking over here, and it's it's got that little circle like nothing's happening. And that's disturbing. I don't know if you guys can actually see. Um, and in fact, what am I on now? Yes, I'm, I'm okay. So, Liz Ryan says, I'm only a beginner, but anxious for your pearls of wisdom. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. Um, so, someone give me a, 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 let me know if this is still streaming because I've got this weird circle thing going on here. I'm going to learn how to make this work, I hope. I think this is better. I just have to figure out. <laughs> Anthony says, tell Liz about the trumpet gods. So uh, that's become sort of a thing now. Um, I do not believe in making trumpet the most important thing in your life. And I know that makes me a little different. And you know, I, I actually think that part of the reason why there's such a drive to make trumpet the most important thing in your life is because it changes everything. It changes um, it it changes the the social dynamic, right? So if you make trumpet the most important thing in your life which is what the trumpet god thing is all about right if you if you make trumpet the most important thing in your life then trumpet has become like a god and um it's really it's just not even healthy but my point is is that um i think part of the way this happened was because music is a subjective art there is no such thing as um, better or worse, really. It's, it's actually true. There's no such thing as better or worse. There's what I like and what I don't like. And each person has a different like, right? Each person has a different standard, a different preference. And um, so in that world, where everything is subjective, how do you have any kind of power as a person? You almost have to have this religious world subject, uh, surrounding that subjective stuff 
for those people to have that power. I hope that makes sense. So, um, let me close some windows here and make sure that's not slowing us down. Okay. So, yes, that's what the whole trumpet God thing is. We don't want to give them that power. That's what that is. But it is kind of funny when we talk about it. <laughs> so, so Javier says, the listening and tonalization has produced a huge impact on my playing. Wonderful. My brother is a pro musician, and he had told me I'm playing fine. I never thought practicing one hour a day could do this. Well, that's, it does work. Thank you, Eddie, again for this, your wisdom, your method. Thank you. Even if I don't play a couple of days, I come back and it still sounds better, the same or better. That's right. That's what we're shooting for. I, I just love to hear those kind of reports. You know, I, I love to hear that because that's really what it's all about. That's really what it's all about. Any other questions? I'm dying for someone to ask about scales <laughs> because I want to use this, this software. <laughs> um, I'm, just, I'm kidding. Don't ask me about scales unless you have a question about scales. <laughs> So Liz, what would you like to know? What kind of questions do you have? It's telling me that I'm I've got a resolution issue. Are I playing am I playing with a new program? Yes, I'm playing with OBS. So it helped. I would like to like even do interviews. I think I could do interviews this way. Javier says, what are the most important scales on jazz improv? The most important scale in jazz improv, believe it or not, is the major scales. <laughs> so that sounds dumb, right? Because that's the same most important scales for all the rest of it. But if you don't have a foundation in the major scales, the rest of it make, has no context. Okay. <laughs> say all. Javier says, please don't answer it to say all of them. Um, they're not all equally important. That's not. Um, most important are the major scales. Even, even if you're into playing more on the blues side, and a lot of Houston players are, by the way. Houston's jazz is very, very heavy blues influenced um you know this is where the whole texas tenor um thing came from i don't know if you guys have ever heard of the texas tenors texas tenors were um it, texas tenor is a style of jazz improv um style of jazz improv which um, like I said, it's very blues oriented and earthy and, um, yeah, I don't even know how to describe it. Uh, if you look up Texas Tenor, you should find some stuff about that. But even, so my point is, even with, even with that heavy blues influence, it's not even the blues if you don't have a context. So the blues, what makes it bluesy is the context that you're in and the, um, the altering of those notes in that scale, right? So anyway, so the major scales are the most important. Anthony says, Clark studies, I started doing them after a long time, and I'm doing study one. Okay, very cool. That's a good... Um, so I stopped actually doing and teaching Clark studies. 
and the reason I did that is because, um, so he says, how would you approach doing them trying to work on better de dexterity? You know, he says to do them fast and in one breath, but if you're working on dexterity, you should go slow. You should practice them very slowly with a metronome. That's so the effort it takes to play slowly with the metronome is the same effort that it takes to play fast with a lot of uh, uh, power and skill. I hope that makes sense. So really, I would put the metronome on and so study one. I think the hardest part of study one is that cross between when you go from C, C to C sharp and back. So like one of the hardest ones is the second one. Well, you know, when you're slamming your fingers down from going from C to C sharp, it's awkward. So we want to go slow and and um, be very deliberate about the way we're playing. And it's, so this is true all the way up to F sharp. Right? <laughs> Let me get this right. And you want to do it about that fast or slower just to get that mechanical movement going in your fingers. That's how I that's how I would recommend doing that anyway. So let's see here. Any other questions? I'm going to have to look up. It says that I don't have the optimum resolution. Nino says, is there a mouthpiece that made a difference in your experience as a musician? Yes, there is. Um, so, the very first mouthpiece that made a difference for me like that was I bought, and it's not available anymore, very sad to say, I bought a uh, M. B1, MB1 by Giardinelli. This was back in the 80s, and um, and it was the first time I had a mouthpiece that would fit around all my teeth. And I my my playing instantly improved. Now I have to be careful the way the way I say spots that are raised up. And they were causing me to play badly. My whole life up to that point, I was playing badly because my the, the mouthpiece sat on those hard spots. And this was the first time I got a mouthpiece big enough to go around all that. And so since then, I only play on huge mouthpieces like that. I hope that makes sense. Anthony says 70 to 80 beats per minute. Per minute. That's correct. That would work perfectly. That's very good. Javier says, stop listening to trumpet player, and I'm listening to guitarist, piano, and sax players, and try to learn to do that on trumpet with its limitations. I really like Pat Martino's licks. Is this okay? What you just described to me right now, Javier, is exactly what most of the greats say um I, I remember a quote from freddie hubbard in an interview where he said exactly that he says he doesn't it wasn't guitarist he never said guitarist i don't think i think he said 
sax players and piano players. And you know what's funny? <laughs> there was a, a, a great pia a guitar player that came to the University of Texas when I was there. And he said that he doesn't listen to guitar players. He's only listening to horn players and trumpet players. And <laughs> so I think this is a thing for jazz players. That we, we, we have a tendency to listen to other instruments to try to absorb that. So yes, that's a good thing. Okay, so Mr. Walker has told me that the the circle thing is coming in. That's what I've had the whole time. I don't think I can change that. It says now no data. Am I still streaming? It says I'm still streaming. So, um, Lincoln Larson says, do you prefer to have a structure practice routine or is it more fluid practice what you need to or want to? Okay, so I have a structure that gives you flexibility. That's the best part of what I teach. There is always structure in my practice. So yes, I would have to say I prefer the structure, but here's the thing. My personality needs that kind of variety. So when I follow the structure, it does not necessarily mean that I'm doing the exact same exercises all the time. In fact, because I'm following this structure, it gives me the freedom to switch it out when I want to. So... So yes, I do follow a structure. That structure is called the Physical Trumpet Pyramid. And um, um, and then we also have that one, one range approach, which is like the Physical Trumpet Pyramid expanded out. Um, anyway, but yes, I do prefer to have structure. Now, why do I want structure? We want structure because structure gives you control. If you only ever practice what you feel like practicing or what you need to practice and do not have structure, then you can't make minor changes to see what will happen because you're constantly changing, right? So when you have structure, it gives you the opportunity to make minor changes. You know, anyone can make huge changes. And, you know, that's, that's part of what's wrong with the world today is the huge, huge change thing, <laughs> right? People, people get a runny nose and you got to shut down the whole world for a runny nose. Um... People make huge changes and, and I call, you know, that's like knee-jerk reaction stuff, right? Um, it is better to make minor changes and work that way. So if you're having trouble with this or having trouble with that, you tweak things. I guess that's a, a, a cool word for it. You tweak um I hope that makes sense. You cannot tweak if you don't have structure. You might be able to tweak what you do with your lifts. You might be able to tweak your posture and stuff like that. But in terms of tweaking your strategy, tweaking your, your routine, that's not possible without structure. I hope that makes sense. So, is it still going in and out? Thank you guys for like bearing with me. I'm trying to figure this out um, as we go. And now that I have this to go on, the only problem I'm having, I think, is this resolution thing. Hello, Raimo. Happy New Year to you, too. 
So it says I've got 1064 by 710 resolution. And it says that's not optimal. I don't know if I need to go up from that or down. Probably down. But I, I know that I can't change that while I'm streaming. So that's something I'll have to change for next time. What's the software you show earlier? That's that's Finale. So Finale is the industry standard for um, writing music. So it's I've been using Finale since I since the 1993. I think I bought my first version. So yeah, that's a lot of years. We're creeping up on 30 years of Finale for me. And this is what the, the, the software I use to write all of my music. So for example, here's a new... Oh, I moved it. <laughs> I'll show you a new piece that I just finished. This duet should be coming out soon. I'm waiting for the people over at J.W. Pepper to get it posted so I can finish it. Get it all up there. So this is our most recently published piece. I call it Fantasita Mar March. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, here it is. It's a hard one. I'll be publishing that um, hopefully next week, I, I'm thinking. I have a, a, a calendar. Yeah, I have it set for Monday, but if I don't hear back from those people at J.W. Pepper, it won't, I'll have to move it from Monday. Or I could publish it without having J.W. Pepper on the list. But yes, this is the industry standard for writing music. And in fact, um, I've been doing it so long and have been, um, I guess you could say I'm good at it. I teach lessons on, the, on that software. Oh, your brother's got it. That's cool. Javier asks, what would you recommend to tweak daily practice? What would you recommend to tweak the daily practice to improve music reading. So, um, here's my approach to sight reading, and maybe I should make a video about that. Um, my approach to sight reading is first, master the keys. So, the, so you're already doing the first bit of it, right? You have to master the keys. And that's what the tonalization studies are for. And, and you keep layering that and layering it and layering it. Um, each time you go past all the 12 keys, you're making your sight reading better. Okay? So then the second thing is... Um, this is going to sound weird, but if you're not listening to the style of music that you're trying to sight read, it doesn't matter. All the other stuff is not going to happen for you. I hope that makes sense. You have to listen to the music that you're actually going to sight read. So, like, if you want to go play brass quintet music, you should be listening to that music. I don't mean the songs. 
I'm not talking about the individual songs. I'm talking about the music for that, um, that, you know, that style. Listen to that style because the style. So, so a lot of people at this point would say, "Oh, you need to listen. Uh, you need to work on your rhythms, right?" Um, but the style dictates how the rhythm is played. So that's premature. If you work on the rhythm, but you don't know the style, then you're really missing it. And then there's the other thing. So yes, you do have to work on rhythms. Now, the way you work on rhythms, in my opinion, is you just play music. And if you hit rhythms that you don't actually know, then you work those out, right? Using the counting system, like one, one and a two and a three and a four, all that stuff. Um, so yes, there is that part of it, but you know what? Most, I guess I'm reluctant to say that because most people I've had to work with, um, for, for working on sight reading, being able to figure the rhythms out was not the problem. It's not good enough to be able to figure out how the rhythm goes because you have to actually be able to feel the rhythm before you play it. And that feeling does not come from working on it. That feeling comes from one, listening to that style, and two, getting experience in that style. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why we do the 50% rule. One of the reasons, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is because we want to have that time getting a, so, uh, acquainted with that style, um, that technique, whatever it is that, that we're doing in that music. I hope that makes sense. So that I guess that would have to be the last part of my answer is make sure you're doing the 50% rule and then, well, not, okay, so also along with that, you should do some sight reading. Um, I'll tell you what, now that there's like a hundred of them up, I think using my You Play First Chair stuff is a great way to do practice sight reading. Just put the You Play First Chair stuff on and read it. And I, I, a lot of them will have commercials in between. Sit through the commercial and then that'll give you enough rest. I don't have enough chops to get through them all. That's why I'm saying that. Not so you watch the commercial, but because you need, a, you need at least that much time to get to the next piece. Um, so... Um, I don't think, I'd be surprised if anyone could just sit there and play all of them and not get tired. I would be real surprised. Um, more than surprised, I'd be impressed. <laughs> so, um, all right, so, Mr. Walker says, I believe the resolution is too low, picture is blurry here. That could be, but sometimes they blur it because the res resolution is too high. And it just can't digest all that. Does that make sense? So I'll have to tweak that. I'm going to look up online and see what this me error message actually means and then go according to that. Raimo says, I have used finale, finale since 1992, but I am thinking to changing to Sibelius. So Sibelius is good too. Um, I think the only reason I'm such a big fan of Finale is just because I spend so many, many hours every day on it. Finale, I, 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 in terms of time spent during my day, I spend more time on Finale than any other software than, in fact, I probably spend more time on Finale than I spend practicing. Really. That's, you know, it's just true. <laughs> I probably should be ashamed to say that. <laughs> um, Mr. Walker says, do you 
input with MIDI or, or uh, MIDI keyboard? No, I don't. Um, never really got around to doing that. I I got so good at, and you know what it is? Is I don't. I compose most of my time at the at finale is composition time, and I don't compose that fast. So I don't need that much more speed than what I'm doing already. If if most of my time was spent transcribing stuff or data entry type stuff, then yes, I would probably want a keyboard so I can go faster. Um, but the time that it takes to think about what I'm doing is slower than the time it takes to type. So it, it, it just doesn't make sense to me to, to do that extra step. Pasagonia says, in your opinion, what is the hardest thing about trumpet playing? In my opinion, what is the hardest thing about trumpet playing? Being sincere, I would have to say, being sincere, not being fake. I think that's the hardest part. I think, so, you know, there's so many people that the reason why they play trumpet, it, it has nothing to do with trumpet. It has nothing to do with music. I had one guy tell me the reason he plays trumpet is for the chicks. I'm like, what chicks are you talking about? <laughs> <I don't... laughs> but uh, he must live in a different world from me. I'm, I'm kidding, okay? I'm kidding. Um, but yes, there's people that, that the reason they play trumpet is because um, it's... I've had people tell me it's the, that the reason they play, like trumpet so much is that the only thing they're good at. I mean, Wow. That's almost heartbreaking. And that's not good for your trumpet playing. Right? So yes, I would say that the hardest thing about being about playing trumpet is being sincere, being honest, being real. You know, that's another thing, right? So many people, the reason why they play trumpet is because they need to be noticed. They need to be acknowledged. They need to be, they need people to tell them that they matter. Right? And, and Trumpet does that for them. And they actually don't have any sincere expression coming from themselves. So what, in my opinion, what should Trumpet be? Trumpet is a tool. You are a person. You're a unique individual. God made you that way, right? You are a unique individual that God made. Nobody else in this world is just like you. The purpose of the trumpet is to share that with the world, whether people like it or not. Right? Right? The purpose of playing trumpet is to 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 um, to make that human connection. I hope that makes sense. So. Um, Anthony says, hardest part about trumpet playing is trying to get your wife out of the store so you can go home to practice. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> All right. So, um... Very good. Yeah, I, I think that's the hardest thing, is, is being honest. Being a, a genuine person and not, not,
You know, it's very saddening. There's so many people who who their their relationship with Trump is not a good thing. It's, it's, it happens so much. It's it's so common. I'll never forget. I had a student one time. I asked him because always in well in the old days, um, in the old days, uh, I I used to always like the very first lesson. Always asked, "What is it you want to accomplish on your horn?" And I had a student one time tell me he wanted to be rich and famous. And, you know, that sounds funny coming from somebody so young. But it's also very, very sad. Where is that coming from? Why do people... You know, I mean, I understand. So when people say rich and famous, you know, I understand wanting to be, um, not wanting to be a burden on society, um, wanting to provide for yourself, wanting to provide for your family. I understand all of that. But when you say rich and famous, that's not what you're talking about, right? What When you say rich and famous... It, it 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 comes from um you know there there's there's so many hurt people in this world and it's it's almost like they think if if they climb the ladder on of trumpet that far that it's going to fix everything for them and and that's the sad part is <laughs> i don't know you know, we all have stuff in our lives, right? you know. And, you know, this guy ended up, I'm not saying that these guys, and people who say that are mentally ill or anything like that, I'm not saying that. It's it's just what they are is hurt. And I know that all of us are hurt. All of us have, have had things in our lives that have, have um, you know, I don't think anybody can escape that. It doesn't matter who you are. You can't escape just the fact that life is tough, right? Um, but sometimes we, some people, the way they deal with that is is not healthy and it's not realistic. And I I think that gets so so often it gets in the way of 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 the the trumpet stuff, you know. Because then the trumpet doesn't become a tool anymore for expression. It becomes something altogether different and unhealthy. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And it ha it's so prevalent. Javier says, I played trumpet. Oh, first he says, that comes from... My oh, there. Is that I see what happened. That comes from Miles having a Ferrari. <laughs> right? Anthony says, I played trumpet to meet girls, but the problem was when I played, the girls would run away from me. <laughs> yeah. All right, what other questions do we have? I actually like this. When I get this figured out, when I get this figured out, we will... You know what? That reminds me. And this is a great opportunity to use that other software I'm going to show you guys and this is in relation to the question what's the hardest thing about trumpet there's something I do with my students okay let's look at this there's something I do with my students, um, talking about creativity, right? And this has this has a lot to do with this, um, this what we're talking about now. Let's let's get a nice green going here. And let's say there's a bunch of trees over here. I 
I hope you guys can see this. Okay, so there's a like. Let's say this is an apple orchard over here, and you're a tree over here. This is you. And you're, in a lot of ways, you're different from these other people over on the right side. Right? You're different from them. I hope it's on the right side for you. Um, now, what the jazz educators like to do, and this is, I usually talk about this in the, co in the context of jazz improvisation. What the jazz educators will do is they'll come in here with their little axe and chop your tree down because they're telling you that oh and by the way you're not an apple tree you're a you're a pear tree or a, or a lemon tree or a orange tree you're some other kind of tree and what the jazz educator says is hey you're not an apple tree and they cut you down here pick you up and try to plant you in this orchard over here. What's going to happen to that tree? That tree is going to die. That tree is going to die. Okay? Because you cut it off from its roots, you you you're trying to 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 uh, um, displace that tree from from where it's from and who it is, okay? And I hope that makes sense, right? You so when i have when, when a student comes in let me go back to that scene again when a student comes in and i hear that they're different let's say you know what let's let's undo a bunch of this let's say they come in here and all they are is a little sapling right and, and understand what I'm saying. If you tell that sapling that who that sapling is, is wrong, and that that sapling should be over here, you're going to dig that sapling up and put it over here by the apple trees. That's so destructive. That kind of teaching is the kind of teaching that destroys potential great students. That's the kind of teaching that destroys potential um, virtuosos, potential famous musicians, okay? That idea that, that who you are and where you are and what you're doing here and now is wrong is destructive. Instead of doing that, what I do is I feed and water this this plant, this sapling, I feed and water it, and I give it sunlight, and I make it grow. That's how I act with students. And, and you know what? As far as I'm concerned, they're all different. This over here on the right with the, the so-called apple orchard is just an illusion. That doesn't even really exist. That's all fake. That's not even all that. That's a, a, um, a figment of the educator's imagination. That's how I see it. So when someone comes into me, I'm nurturing that. I'm not going to dig them up and toss them aside saying, no, this is not right. And this, what I'm saying here, yes, I teach it in the context of jazz improvisation, but I, I started off that way. Today, I teach that same concept for everything creative. I hope that makes sense. Gentris Moore says, 
I want to express my soul and touch others. Congratulations. That's the stuff I want to hear. Anthony says, but seriously, I think to play trumpet really well is reason enough. Yeah, that's a good answer too. Javier says, girls dig on guitar players and singers. He was on the wrong track. <laughs> and then he says, chili tree. That's... Uh, um, that would be my tree, right? I love, um, uh, what do they call it? Arvo, Arvo chilies, right? Is that, I don't, is it chili Arvo or uh, Arvo chili? Richard says, hey everybody, happy new year. Howdy Richard, nice to see you. Um, Javier says, guest jazz ed educators also try to clone students. Yes, that's what I'm talking about with the clone thing. And the thing is, you can't do it. It's not possible. And it's extremely destructive. Richard says, I came across a great book written by Kenny Werner called Effortless Mastery. Every musician should read it. Um, yeah, it's... That's a good story. I like that. That story, that's part of my story. Um, it's, yeah, Effortless Mastery. I read that book in, it was so soon after it came out. I'm thinking, I want to say late 90s. I have some problems with the book. And, um, but, I, it's not like I don't tell people that they shouldn't watch or read it. I think people should read it. But I think you, just like with every other book, you should read it. And and for all other things too, by the way. Um, you know, I remember when all this COVID-19 stuff went down. And I started sharing my, my thoughts online on Facebook and there were some people who came back to me and said Eddie shouldn't say that right um, that I'm I, that I'm not oh I forgot to change the screen here they say that I'm not qualified to say stuff about the virus and the shutdowns and all that stuff that I'm not qualified I need to, to um, uh, defer to the experts, right? And then this is why I'm bringing it up here, not to bring it up again, but because the guy said, you're an expert at trumpet playing. People respect you for trumpet playing and blah, blah, blah. And then I should respect the guys who do this other stuff. Well, I'm sorry. I never saw myself as an expert. And in fact, I think anyone who does see themselves as an expert has probably got some mental problems. Right? Um, it's human nature that the more qualified you become at a certain topic, the more you realize you don't know squat about that topic. It's called humility. And the people who go around saying that they are experts are the ones who don't have humility and the only way you could possibly have um, no humility is if you aren't really expert at all. That's my, my thing, right? So, when I'm talking about, and I'm not saying this because of COVID, I'm talking about the book Effortless Mastery, I'm not telling you just to, to take what he writes with a grain of salt. I'm saying take what everybody writes with a grain of salt. Take everything I say with a grain of salt, right? Don't just be like taking what I say and, and, um, right. So I'm, I'm reading this. Richard says exactly. You don't need to, need to, what do I, I don't know. You don't need to me, a car mechanic to drive. Oh, you don't have to be a car mechanic to drive a car. Exactly. So, um, so yes, I think you should scrutinize everything. Always scrutinize everything. 
scrutinize always. Question everything always. Question me always. Always. Don't ever accept any of this stuff without checking it out yourself. I mean, that makes no sense at all. Right? So, there are some things in his book. You know, his book influenced me a lot, but maybe not in the way that someone might predict. Because I actually had a very negative reaction to his book, but that negative reaction, reaction put me in the right direction. And if it wasn't for reading his book, I would have never gone in the right direction in the first place. And I, I'll tell you this too. His story about going down to Brazil to take lessons with that dude and how that went is an extremely important his, uh, story. And I'm glad he, he shared that story with everybody. I think about that often. The story he, he shared in that first half of his book. Um, and by the way, it's the second half of the book I have most of the problem with. Not the first half. The first half is wonderful. But yes, everybody should be scrutinized always. And the people who tell you, how dare you scrutinize me, are the people who you should be the most afraid of to get advice from them. That's, and that's not just me. I'm not just saying that because I'm some weirdo. I'm saying that because I read different philosophy and stuff like that and that's how things have always been i don't know why people can't digest that anymore today but that's how stuff how how great thinkers have always thought you scrutinize everything it's not you know people say um i believe the science i trust the science right um it's not science if you have to trust it it's not science if you don't question it. I could go on about that forever. <laughs> the, Javier says, There is this thing about mouthpieces. You have to try a lot of them, even if you find one that works. I guess it's a placebo thing. <laughs> um, speaking of mouthpieces, I... I'm still on my my quest. So yes, you're right, you know. You know, I did real good in the earlier part of my career, but I think it was because I was so broke. You know, I think you know, if if you barely have money to put food on the table or barely enough money to pay rent, you know, it's very difficult to justify spending money on a mouthpiece. Uh, Anthony says, it's like the more you learn to start to realize how much you didn't know about trumpet. That's exactly right. That's what I'm saying. Anybody who stands there and says, oh, I'm an authority on this, doesn't have any humility. And if they don't have humility, it's because they haven't actually reached um, that point yet in their in their education or their experience or whatever the higher you get in your field the more you realize this just isn't possible it's not humanly possible to know all of it it's not humanly possible to be that good at any subject it's impossible to be infallible I hope that's what I'm, I hope you guys understand what I'm saying there. Reed says, how do you recommend being able to balance improving at trumpet technique while also memorizing tunes and learning improvisation? Good question. Um, so, I do oh, this is an opportunity for me to use my my um thing again let's go to that other screen again and clear it
I do what I call rotations, right? So, um, let's say, for example, you want to do, now let me see what you said on here. You said, how do you recommend being balanced? Improving trumpet, which trumpet technique, while also memorizing tunes and learning improvisation. So let's let's look at it just with what you've given here. You have technique. You have um, tunes, and you have improv. You know what? That looks very similar to what I teach for jazz, right? You're only missing two things. I call it the five areas of study. Um, listening is an important too. Right? Listening and what's missing here? Language. Okay. I hope that's the right spelling. So here's what we do. We split it up. So you do this and then you do that. And then you work on your tunes. And then you work on your improv. Then you work on your language. Then you go back here and work on that again. Listening. Technique. Tunes. Improv. Language. Then go back and do it again. Listening. Technique. Tunes. Language. Improv. Over and over and over again. A constant cycle. Okay? Let me open up I'll have to make a new a new scene on here. And let's see here. I'll come back to this. And I'll open up I just want to show you what my form looks like. Uh, I gotta find it. <laughs> so, let's see here. I think you guys will like this. So, here's my uh, under practice. Oh, I remember where I put that. That's over here. It, you might say, well, how in the world is it that you don't know where this stuff is if you're using it? Because it takes me months to get through it. That's why. Technique rotation. So let me show you this. I'm going to Add window. Okay, we're here. Let me squeeze it in so that it fits. Okay, here we go. Transition, and there we are. Let me show you this. So I go through a rotation. This is my technique rotation, right? And now this covers a lot of the stuff that you're talking about. This is not the only rotation I do. I do rotations of rotations. <laughs> so it is actually quite nuts. I'll, I'll show you the notebook where I keep all this stuff. Um, so what I'll do is start a new key. So like right now, I'm in the key of E, right? Let me zoom in on this a little bit so you see it better. So 
So I write a new motif sheet. That's something you're not going to understand yet. When I get it done, I'll do the date. And go on to the next step. Tonalization. I'll do the major tonalization studies. Then I have a major extended tonalization studies, all in the key of E. Then I do pentatonic studies when that is done. And by the way, I'll put the date here. Like if I finish that tomorrow, I've met 21 up here. So the date means that I finished it. And let's say the next day I'll, I'll do the next part. And let's say the next day I do the next part. I don't do more than, um, I don't do more than one tonalization study a day. So this, this section here, to get this done, it's at least three days of work here because I don't do more than one a day. I hope that makes sense. So when this is done, it'll, when this line is done, it'll look something like this. Now let's look at all the different things that are going on here. I'm doing arpeggios. I'm doing tonalization in the minor, the relative minor. I'm doing our, uh, more arpeggios. Then I work on auto mix in that. Oh, that's a tune I wrote. You wouldn't know that. Um, I do. I I do this tune. Each one of these gets five slash marks, and there's ten boxes. So that's fifty times I play that, and it's just improvising. I fifty choruses over that tune. When that's done, I'll put the date. Then I do all of my language sheets, and those language sheets are what I was talking about up here. Write a new motif sheet. That's a language sheet. Okay. And that's when I do all the ones that I have, I'll put the date here. Then this is something that I won't tell you guys about. Um, harmonic studies. I do the 1451 one studies. I'll do that here. And... So as you see, this is a whole sequence of stuff that I work on to cover all the bases that I practice. So that's the answer to your question is Basically, what I'm saying is be organized about it. Okay, that's what I, that's the answer to your question. Be organized with the stuff you're covering so that you can um, cycle through all of it uh, systematically. I hope that makes sense. Oh, I lost the track. What happened there? Okay, so um, that's weird. So, next, Raimo says I've gone through hundreds of mouthpieces on paper, no measuring standard. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I can believe that. I can believe that. So, um, I'm having trouble reading you guys' earlier stuff that keeps moving. Okay, Reed says, usually uh, at a minimum two, 
One mouthpiece for classical, legit. One for more commercial. Yes, I usually have three mouthpieces. And I ordered a new one. Can you believe that? Um, just yesterday I ordered a new one. Anthony says, my beautiful wife told me at la my last recital to, to have humility. I didn't listen to her <laughs> and I got humiliated. <laughs> oh, man. Raima says, I'm still trying to find a mouthpiece for my flugelhorn. German shank, deep cup, throat is 4.3 millimeters. So I ended up going back to um, Warburton for my my mouthpiece for my flugelhorn. So um, Reed says, "Great, thank you for addressing this. One problem I have is getting frustrated with range, which can hamper other areas of development. So the range thing." Um, the range thing for me is, is more about familiarity than anything else. We want to be familiar with those notes so that, because the more familiar you become with those notes, the less effort it takes. It's, it becomes almost natural and it, it really isn't a physical thing. If it is still a physical thing, it's because you're not familiar with it enough yet. And there's also this other problem, right? Because you could have improper familiarity, right? So like, sort of like people who are afraid to do math, right? But their fear of math actually makes it worse. And there is this, and I'm not saying this about you, Reed, because I don't, I've never heard you. So I'm not saying this. I'm just saying that um, there are people who, they're, they're, it's not fear of the upper register, but their attitude towards the upper register actually makes stuff worse. And they get upset, they get frustrated and stuff, and it really messes up the whole process of becoming familiar because what they're becoming familiar with is, to use a word that I actually don't like in this kind of setting, becomes toxic. Right? I hope that makes sense. So, um, so yeah, so if you're playing arpeggios and stuff like that, so the arpeggios that you're playing should not go out of your range. The licks should not go out of your range. And uh, so the sheets that I have that have all my licks on them, I always write them in the key of C, and then I transpose them to the key I'm on right now. There are times when it goes out of my range and I simply don't do the lick. I don't go out of my range. I call it range limiting. I do not go out of my range because that's what sets everything off balance. When you try for the notes and it doesn't happen, and then all this like mental stuff starts happening. And that's when stuff starts breaking down. And it's, it's not a physical thing that breaks down, it's a mental thing, it's a psychological thing. Javier said, that's one cool chart. <laughs> so yes, I, that's one of many actually. Um, oh, and I said I was gonna, I told you I was gonna show you guys the notebooks. So I store all this stuff, so I've got many of those forms, I shouldn't say many, but several. So like here's my tune rotation list. Let me see if I can make sure you guys see that. So that's my tune rotation list, right? And I just put all this stuff, and you can see the tabs. So I can get to the different sheets. Um, see, yeah, I just put my finger on that tab. It takes me to, to the form I need. And then this one has other ones. Like I have my tune 
Now this isn't this book is not all practice stuff. Some of this is my other work. I I work and do my practicing the same way. I hope that makes sense. So all right. Let me get back there. So the read asks, do you use play along somewhere in there? Yes, I do. One of my forms here has a section in it for sight reading, and I use um, the play alongs for sight reading. I don't use my play alongs because I wrote that stuff. That's not really sight reading, <laughs> right? But I use play alongs for sight reading. I think that's the best way to use them. Javier says, talking about standards, Blue Boss of Pat Martino's solo rock. <laughs> That's cool. Um, Reed says, great answer, thank you. How much time are you spending per day on average? So right now I'm not practicing at all. I decided to take two weeks off since I didn't have a New Year's gig or a Christmas Eve gig. First time in my entire life. I had Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve gigs in high school. Um, this is the first time. In fact, I went the whole year. My Easter gig got canceled. Then um, no Christmas Eve gig, no New Year's Eve gig. I actually did get called for New Year's Eve, but it wasn't enough money, so I turned it down. Um... <laughs> so, um, so yes, I did get an offer, but I, I, and also those people, well, I won't go into that. Um, now I practice, I don't think how much you practice matters. That's going to be my answer for that. Sometimes I practice a lot. Sometimes I practice very little. Okay, now with my system, and so I think someone mentioned that today. I think it was maybe Javier said that he can go two days off and come back and not have any trouble. And in fact, he sounds even better. Um, I think that was Javier. And this is part of my system. You don't have to practice and in fact, we were talking earlier about the trumpet gods. I do actually think that when we have the attitude, <laughs> there you go, right? The, the, the gods. Oh, so yes, two weeks, trumpet gods going to be mad, right? So that's what we're talking about, right? Um, that's where this whole trumpet gods thing got started. Because on Facebook, I was having this big old argument. Um, and they were threatening to kick me off of the forum, and I said, well, if you, if you feel that way, I'll just get off myself, right? And I, because I said, how dare me, right? Anyone who practices, um, everyone, anyone who feels like they absolutely must practice every day, music has become an idol to them. And a lot of people get upset about that, right? And enough to like threaten to kick me off of the forum. And but yes, if trumpet is more important to you than anything else in the world, then trumpet has become a god. So and the thing is, here's, here's the most ironic part of that, is those people don't normally sound any good. <laughs> it's like, that's hard to put your, wrap your head around, right? You sold your soul to the devil, and you still suck. Um, <laughs> you know? So, so, no, I think how much you practice actually has very little to do with how good you can become. 
I hope that makes sense. So, um, Anthony says, so let's go back to Javier. Oh, wait. So, Reed asks, "How do I take days off? Um, I just said I do take, uh, right now taking two weeks off. Um, that ends tomorrow. I'll start practicing tomorrow. I do believe in taking at least, and I stress the word at least, at least um, one day a week off, at least. Reed says, your, pra your practice pyramid book is fantastic, by the way. Thank you. Just started working with it over the past couple weeks. Great. Let me know if you have any questions about that along the way, okay? Um, I like how systematic it is. Good. Um, Javier says, two weeks, trumpet guard's going to be mad. That's right. That's what we were talking about. Um... Anthony says, I own four trumpets. Is it a bad thing to use? Um, Javier says, my brother, he is top-notch jazz guitar player. Oh, that's cool. Practicing eight hours a day, took a toll on his health, and had a bad injury in his hand. That's right. Some musicians are like athletes, don't know when to stop pushing. That's right. That's exactly right. So, oh, look at that. I didn't realize we had gone so late. <laughs> I think I should stop now. I've got a lot to do today. Um, all right. Well, I hope this worked for you guys. I'll get the kinks worked out um, with this with this um, resolution issue. I don't know how bad it was. So um, anyway, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for hanging out. It's great to see all you guys. And um, I'm excited about being able to share screen with you like that. This also opens up to where we can have, I can maybe have interviews in the future. See you later, Raimo. And Reed, thank you. Um, Javier, thank you. Nice to see you guys again. Anthony, all right. Well, all right, everybody. God bless you guys. And this is the first video. I'm hoping 40 videos in a row. 40. Now, the ones on Saturday are um, the one. You can only get to the ones on Saturday on my website. Okay. That's the, the behind the wheel video. Okay. All right. So that's it. God bless you guys. We will see you next time. If I can get this to close. <laughs> it's frozen.